Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Mario Ritter, Susan Shand, and Brian Lynn. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first... The Pacific nation of Palau will soon ban many types of sunscreen in an effort to protect its coral reefs. President Tommy Remingasau Jr. signed legislation recently that bans reef toxic sunscreen beginning in 2020. The law defines reef toxic sunscreen as containing any one of 10 chemicals, including oxybenzone. Other chemicals may also be banned. Officials will take banned sunscreens from visitors who carry them into the country. Businesses that sell the banned products will be fined up to $1,000. In a statement, Remengazau said that the punishments find the right balance between educating tourists and scaring them away. The law also requires tour operators to start providing customers with reusable cups, drinking straws, and food containers. The president said the legislation was introduced based on information from a 2017 report. The report found that sunscreen products were widespread in Palau's famous jellyfish lake. The lake was closed for more than a year because of a decrease in jellyfish numbers. It was recently reopened. The president also noted that plastic waste, chemical pollution, and climate change all threaten the country's environmental health. In July, the American state of Hawaii banned the sale of sunscreen containing the chemicals oxybenzone and octanoxate beginning in 2021. However, tourists will still be able to bring the banned sunscreen with them into the state. They may also buy the sunscreen in Hawaii if they have a doctor's prescription. Scientists have found that some chemicals in sunscreen can be toxic to coral reefs. The reefs are an important part of the ocean environment and popular with tourists. But some critics say there are not enough independent scientific studies on the issue. Others worry that people will suffer from too much sun contact if they stop using the products. Some manufacturers have already started selling reef-friendly sunscreen. Palau is located east of the Philippines and north of Indonesia. The nation is home to 21,000 people. Its economy depends on tourism and fishing. Palau has an agreement with the United States that provides economic assistance, the fence of the territory, and other benefits. Microsoft founder Bill Gates presented a container of feces to visitors to a trade show in China. No, not the China International Import Expo in Shanghai. Gates is at the reinvented Toilet Expo in Beijing to discuss developing a safe process to remove human waste. 
You might guess what's in this beaker, and you'd be right. Human feces, the Microsoft founder told the gathering. He said, this small amount of feces could contain as many as 200 trillion rotavirus cells, 20 billion Shigella bacteria, and 100,000 parasitic worm eggs. Gates noted that these microbes cause diseases that kill almost 500,000 children under the age of five every year. More than 20 companies and research organizations are showing new toilet technologies at the three-day expo. These include self-contained toilets, a small self-powered waste treatment system called the Omni Processor, and other inventions. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation presented its own idea for a future toilet that does not require water. Instead, it uses chemicals to turn human waste into fertilizer. There are several designs of the toilet, but all work by separating liquid and solid waste. The current toilet simply sends the waste away in the water, whereas these toilets don't have the sewer. They take both the liquids and solids and do chemical work on it, including burning it in most cases, Gates told Reuters. He compared the development of waterless toilets to that of personal computing in the mid-1970s. The researchers are planning to show the waterless toilets to manufacturers. Gates said he expects that a more than $6 billion market for the toilets will develop by 2030. I'm Mario Ritter. People in several American cities are wondering where will the company Amazon build its new second headquarters. A recent news report in the Wall Street Journal said Amazon will divide its new headquarters between two cities. The report said the company is considering Queens in New York City, Arlington, Virginia, and Dallas, Texas. The New York Times reports that Dallas is not being considered, and the two cities are Queens and Arlington. Amazon will keep its current headquarters in Seattle, Washington. Spokesman Adam Cedo said Amazon refused to comment on the reports. Amazon's decision to build another headquarters caused major American cities to compete with each other. Many cities hoped for the 50,000 new jobs the company promised. Amazon said most of the new jobs will pay a lot of money. Amazon told the cities that it wanted financial incentives such as lower taxes and other deals. It also wanted a city with more than one million people, a close airport, good public transportation, and a lot of land. The company received 238 proposals and chose 20 of them in January. The unusual decision to divide the 50,000 jobs between two cities will permit the company to find the right people for the jobs. It also could reduce pressure for housing and transportation, 
the Wall Street Journal reported. The New York Times reported that company officials met last month with New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. The newspaper said the state offered possibly hundreds of millions of dollars in incentives. Amazon also met with New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio, the newspaper reported. The New York Times reported that the governor said, I'll change my name to Amazon Cuomo if that's what it takes. Amazon has said it could spend more than $5 billion on the new headquarters over the next 17 years. This is about the same as it has spent in Seattle, which has 33 buildings, 23 restaurants, and 40,000 employees. I'm Susan Shand. A Yemeni teacher has given up a valuable part of his life to improve education in the face of continuing war. He turned his home into a school that now serves hundreds of students. The teacher, Adil al-Sharihi, said he has watched students suffer for more than three years during the country's civil war. Al-Sharihi lives in the southwestern city of Taiz. The area has been at the center of a conflict. The war between Houthi rebels and forces loyal to Yemeni President Abid Rabo Mansour Hadi started in 2015. At the time, Houthi militants had captured large areas of Yemen, including the capital, Sana'a. A Saudi-led coalition is fighting a ground and air campaign in support of the government of Hadi, who fled to Saudi Arabia in exile. Iran supports the Houthi rebels. The war has spread to different parts of Yemen. Local and international aid agencies warn the conflict has created one of the worst humanitarian crises of the 21st century. A weak economy has led to poverty and severe famine threatening millions of people. When war first broke out, Adil al-Sharihi said schools in his area began closing. He and other parents had nowhere to send their children. It also was not safe for the children to be on the streets. Al-Sharihi wanted to provide some form of education for students, although violence and poor living conditions remained threats. So he came up with the idea to turn his three-level home into a school. Falling bombs and planted landmines made it harder for children to reach their schools, Al-Sharihi told VOA. Because of the war, my children and the children of everyone I know were unable to get their education. So I decided to turn my own house into a school so that students could get their education safely. Sharon Varkey helps lead the United Nations Children's Agency, or UNICEF, in Yemen. He told VOA the conflict is causing many problems for the country's education system. Currently, about 2 million children are not able to attend school. 
tens of thousands of Yemeni teachers have gone on strike in recent months in government-controlled areas to demand better pay. In rebel areas, tens of thousands more have not been paid for at least two years, a UNICEF report found. Varki said more than 270 attacks have been reported on schools since the war began. About 2,500 schools have been damaged or destroyed throughout the country. Varki added that the breakdown of the education system is likely to have serious long-term effects on the country. He said history has shown that children who do not get an education are at greater risk of turning to child labor. Many also end up joining armed groups or getting married as children. Al-Sharihi said that within the first year of opening his home school, 500 boys and girls between the ages of 6 and 15 signed up to attend classes. Today, he gets about 700 students daily. He has 13 classrooms and 16 volunteer teachers. But Al-Sharihi said he is always looking for more people to help. He lacks many materials usually found in schools, such as books, paper, and chalkboards. Most students have to sit on the ground. But Al-Sharihi said the conditions have not stopped his students from seeking learning and normal life in the face of severe conflict. He is urging the international community to support efforts aimed at solving Yemen's education crisis. I'm Brian Lynn. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Ronald Reagan. He was president for two terms and served from 1981 to 1989. Before that, he was the governor of California, worked as an actor, and led a labor union. As president, Reagan is credited for changing the direction of the country. He tried to establish a feeling of confidence in the American people. Although not everyone profited equally from his policies, the president rarely suffered in public opinion polls. Reagan was called the great communicator because he was able to connect with many Americans and to speak persuasively about conservative values. He is remembered warmly by many Republican Party politicians and voters especially. Ronald Reagan is often linked to California and the American West, but he was born and raised in Illinois, in the center of the United States. His father sold shoes, and his mother mostly took care of Ronald and his older brother, Neil. The entire family supported the Democratic Party, especially President Franklin Roosevelt. While the boys were growing up, the Reagans did not have much money, and the father suffered from alcoholism. But Ronald was energetic and took part in many activities. He played football and basketball, ran on the track team, swam, acted in plays, led student groups, wrote for school newspapers and yearbooks, and worked several jobs to help pay for his education and support his parents. He attended Eureka College in Illinois and completed his studies in 1932. One of his first jobs out of college was as a sports announcer for
for a radio station. He had an appealing voice and a natural way of talking that was a good fit for radio. Reagan was also good-looking and a dependable worker. In time, he was offered a chance to act in movies and moved to California. During his acting career, Reagan made more than 50 films. He also married actress Jane Wyman and had two children with her. But after several years, the relationship ended. Their marriage ended in divorce. Four years later, Reagan married another actress. Her name was Anne Robbins, but she was called Nancy Davis. They also had two children. As he was starting his second family, Reagan began another part of his career. He served as host of a popular television series about the American West. He also became president of a labor union, the Screen Actors Guild. It represented actors, announcers, and others working in the film and television industry. During that time, Reagan's political beliefs changed. He increasingly supported conservative ideas. During public appearances, he often spoke in support of business interests. He also expressed concern that the federal government was limiting Americans' freedom. The message was well received by many Americans. Although the Democratic Party was in power for most of the 1960s, a number of Americans were becoming increasingly conservative. Reagan won national recognition in 1966 when he successfully ran for governor of California as a Republican. In 1970, voters re-elected him to the position. But Reagan had set his sights on the presidency he sought the Republican nomination in both 1968 and 1976. Finally, in 1980, he won the office. By that time, he had already had several careers, as well as a long life. At age 69, he was the oldest person until then to be elected president. When Reagan took office, he made improving the U.S. economy his highest concern. One way to do that, he believed, was to reduce the influence of the federal government. He wanted especially to cut some of the government programs that former President Lyndon Johnson had put in place to help poor people. Reagan believed that cutting taxes especially on big businesses, would help strengthen the economy and in time help everyone. In a speech after taking office, Reagan noted that government is not the solution to our problem, government is the problem. At first, the economy continued to struggle, but in a few years, Reagan's policies appeared to work. Unemployment dropped, the stock market rose, and many industries grew quickly. Americans often remember Reagan's presidency as a time of economic growth. Not everyone benefited equally, however. Reagan's critics observed that his policies largely helped people who were already wealthy. The divide between rich and middle-class Americans increased during Reagan's presidency. And Reagan did not reduce government spending in all areas. In fact, he sharply increased military spending. One result was a large national debt. Another result, Reagan supporters say, 
was a quicker end to the Cold War. One of Reagan's major foreign policy goals was to end the standoff with the Soviet Union. He believed that building up the U.S. military was the best way to pressure the Soviets to reach an agreement on arms control. Reagan also spoke out strongly against communism. In his second term, he famously appealed to the new Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, to tear down the Berlin Wall. For some, the wall was a sign of communism. Many historians say Reagan's policies worked. For sure, Reagan and Gorbachev improved relations between their countries. And in time, the Soviet leadership permitted the Berlin Wall to come down. In addition to the economy and the Cold War, Reagan is often remembered for his likable personality. He spoke easily with the public, often had a positive message about the country, and usually appeared cheerful. He won even more public approval after a man with mental problems tried to kill him. The bullets seriously injured several people nearby and just missed Reagan's heart. Yet, shortly after he was shot, the president joked with his wife and with his doctors. Opinion polls showed that the recovered president was more popular than ever. Reagan's political image also survived a scandal known as Iran-Contra. In brief, Congress found that a number of government officials secretly sold U.S. weapons to Iran as part of a deal to free hostages. Then, the officials used some of the money to help rebels in Nicaragua. The actions violated congressional rules. They also challenged Reagan's promise that he had not traded weapons for hostages. The president apologized for any part he had played in the events. Polls showed that, in general, the American public accepted his apology and continued to trust him. Unlike most U.S. presidents who lose public support during their terms, Reagan finished his time in office as he had taken it, with the support of more than half of Americans. Reagan retired to his home in California with his wife, Nancy. For several years, he wrote about his life and helped organize his presidential library. But in a few years, the former president announced that he suffered from Alzheimer's. The disease affects people's ability to think, remember, and express themselves. Soon. Reagan disappeared from public life. He died in 2004. But he is well remembered as an able politician who could work effectively with many people. He is also remembered, by both supporters and critics, for being a powerful voice for conservative ideas and traditional values. His influence extended beyond his two terms. Later generations of leaders and voters called themselves Reagan Republicans. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.